After going through chapters on the anatomy of the bones of the skeletal system, um, there's a chapter on joints and articulations, their structure and the movements that they allow. Now, um, many students are surprised when we begin with, say, the joints between the bones of the skull, um, because it's assumed that part of the definition of the word uh, joint uh, is that it allows uh, movement, but that is not the case. And so uh, a joint is where we have uh, two different uh, skeletal elements which uh, articulate. And uh, they vary in both the amount of movement that they allow, and so we can classify uh, joints based on whether they allow no movement, that's a synarthrosis, a little movement, an amphiarthrosis, or whether they're freely movable and um, they are a diarthrosis. Unfortunately for anatomy students, there's more than one classification system for joints. Not only can one have this functional set, um, but also then a structural set. So what is it uh, that one finds where these um, two surfaces articulate? Is it fibrous connective tissue? In which case it is a fibrous joint. Is it cartilage? In which case it's a cartilaginous joint. Is there a space, a joint cavity with a synovial fluid? Um, in which case it is a synovial uh, joint. And so um, here uh, I'm just going to go through uh, some of uh, the different types of joints in the body and then end by revisiting uh, the types of motions which are allowed there. So between the skull bones, we have these sutures where the uh, bones actually interdigitate, producing these little you know, processes which uh, interlock uh, for greater structural strength. And because it is fibrous connective tissue like collagen, which one would find uh, between the surfaces, this would be an example of a fibrous joint. So structurally, uh, these are fibrous joints, but functionally they are synarthroses because no movement is uh, allowed there. So the sutures uh, between skull bones, examples of synarthroses and fibrous joints. Um, another example of a synarthrosis, which is a fibrous joint, uh, are, is the type of joint known as a gomphosis, where uh, the teeth are anchored in uh, their sockets. And so uh, we have uh, the maxilla, uh, which holds uh, the teeth of uh, the upper jaw, and the mandible holds the teeth of the lower jaw. And uh, these are joints where we have two surfaces articulating, um, but they are not movable. They are synarthroses, and it is fibrous connective tissue which anchors these together. So that would be an example of a fibrous joint. So both sutures and gomphoses would be examples of synarthroses, uh, which uh, are fibrous joints. It is also possible to have uh, cartilage uniting uh, two uh, uh, adjacent uh, uh, structures. And so between the two pubic bones, for example, we have a band of fiber cartilage. Uh, so it is a cartilaginous joint structurally and it is an amphiarthrosis functionally. While it is not a freely movable joint, a little bit of joint uh, of movement is allowed here. And in late pregnancy, the hormone relaxin um, will increase the amount of movement uh, permitted here to make uh, labor a little easier. And so here is a cartilaginous joint because it is cartilage uniting the uh, neighboring structures, and an amphiarthrosis because a little bit of movement is, um, uh, is uh, permitted uh, here. Um, now, uh, if we have, we'll come back to this one. Um, uh, there is also fiber cartilage between the bodies of neighboring vertebrae. So between the bodies of neighboring vertebrae, we also have uh, a cartilaginous joint. And at this particular spot, a little bit of movement is also permitted. So this is also an amphiarthrosis, which allows a little bit of movement. Um, there is also a third um, a class, uh, which we can see here, because 
Each vertebra has a flat superior articular process and a flat inferior articular process. And when vertebrae are adjacent to uh, each other, um, these contact each other in a joint. A greater amount of movement is permitted here, so it is known as a diarthrosis. And there's actually a space between the superior articular uh, processes and the inferior articular processes. There is an actual space. So this area is surrounded by a membrane known as a synovial membrane. Um, this space is filled with a lubricating fluid known as synovial fluid, and this then is known as a synovial joint. And so structurally, if you were to ask, you know, what is the nature of, you know, the contact between these articulating surfaces? You can have a fibrous joint, if it's fibrous connective tissue like collagen, which unites them. Um, an amp I'm sorry, a cartilaginous joint, if it's cartilage, uh, which uh, unites uh, them. Or if there's a joint cavity, then it is a synovial joint. Um, and so uh, the uh, synovial uh, uh, joints are uh, diarthroses. They are freely uh, movable. Um, there are a few other uh, examples of synarthroses and, uh, and amphiarthroses before I get to the diarthroses. So for example, uh, when I was younger, my humerus was not completely uh, bone yet. I had bone in the shaft and bone in the epiphysis, but cartilage at the epiphyseal plate. So this would have been a type of joint, a cartilaginous joint, cartilage separating these two bone fronts, but it was not movable. So that would have been a synarthrosis, uh, which was uh, cartilaginous. Um, you can have an amphiarthrosis, uh, which is made of fibrous connective tissue, like the distal articulation of the uh, tibia and uh, fibula, where a little bit of movement is uh, permitted. So uh, we can classify joints both structurally and functionally. Uh, sometimes it's a little difficult because if you were to think, say, what can I do with my vertebral column, for example, um, you're actually looking at multiple joints. So there are the amphiarthroses um, uh, between the bodies of vertebrae, but then uh, there is a pair of uh, superior and inferior uh, articular uh, processes forming synovial joints, which are diarthroses. And so uh, when we talk about the movement of the vertebral column, how it allows lateral flexion, flexion extension, and rotation, that's actually the sum of uh, different types of uh, joints and not uh, just one. So sometimes it is a bit uh, more uh, complicated. Um, as I go through the diarthroses, I'll be using terms like flexion, extension, abduction, adduction. Uh, so to begin with, um, uh, flexion, uh, I'm sorry, when we stay in an anatomical position, which would be standing upright and our palms facing forward, our feet flat on the ground, um, uh, we are uh, extended in, you know, our uh, arms, our legs, you know, etc. And now moving body parts uh, closer together um, uh, is uh, flexion. So here uh, I can flex uh, the neck, I can flex uh, the thorax, um, and then when I return to anatomical position, that is known as extension. If you go a little bit beyond anatomical position, that is known as hyper uh, extension. And uh, so um, we can use terms like this as we go into the diarthroses. Um, uh, obviously, uh, you know, very important because a lot of people injure, you know, their shoulders, their hips, et cetera, and a lot of physical therapy is, is uh, dealing with those. So all of the following joints, which I will look at, are um, synovial joints structurally in that they have a joint cavity and a synovial fluid, um, but then they are uh, diarthroses functionally in that they allow free movement. Now, um, we classify these diarthroses into categories as well. So once again, you know, the study of anatomy is you know, the study of structure, and so very often there's naming of categories and then subcategories, and so this chapter is a, a brilliant example of uh, anatomical labeling. 
Um, so if you were to look at the diarthroses, and if you ask physically what types of surfaces are we talking about? Well, in some diarthroses, we simply have essentially flat um, uh, surfaces which glide past each other. So one flat plane here, one flat plane, and they're free to glide like uh, we saw in the articular processes in the vertebrae. Um, so in our carpal bones in our hand or our tarsal bones in our um, uh, feet, we have these flat surfaces which we can call planar joints. And if you ask what type of mo motion would we see here? Well, in the wrist, we could just say well, we see a gliding motion. Um, here in uh, the uh, foot, uh, we would actually give it a special name. If I take uh, my foot and I allow the gliding between the intertarsal joints uh, so that the bottoms of my feet are facing the midline, that is known as inversion. If I take my uh, feet and then I have the bottoms of my feet uh, uh, you know, face away from uh, the midline, that is known as eversion. And so while in some places we just call the motion that they allow gliding, so gliding uh, between the vertebral joints or gliding in uh, the wrist, here in the foot we can refer to it as inversion and uh, eversion, uh, this movement between the um, uh, the tarsal uh, bones. Um, now, as uh, we look at, uh, at a hand, once again, we have those uh, gliding uh, joints uh, between uh, the um, uh, between uh, the carpal uh, uh, between the carpal bones. Um, but then we see different types of joints between the phalanges. These would be called the interphalangeal joints um, or um, between the metacarpals and the proximal uh, phalanges. These would be called metacarpophalangeal uh, joints. Um, I'm going to go through these twice. Uh, one's kind of, you know, specific to the region of the body, and then I'll talk about the motions again at the end. Um, Many of the joints of our body are called uh, hinge joints, um, and they only allow, say, flexion and extension. So the joints between the uh, phalanges, uh, these are called uh, hinge joints. And so uh, between, say, the proximal phalanges and the middle phalanges, or the middle phalanges and the distal phalanges, then we can do flexion and um, extension. Once again, when we are in anatomical position, then our hands would be extended. When we move them uh, closer uh, to uh, each other, that would be flexion. Um, there is another type of joint uh, there, which uh, is a little more uh, mobile, um, where a rounded end of a bone fits into a, a rounded um, a depression for it, so a concave and a convex uh, surface. Uh, and so uh, that would be what we see between the metacarpals and the proximal phalanges. So not only can I flex and extend, but I can also do another type of movement called abduction and adduction. Um, abduction is movement away from the midline, if we refer to the position, an anatomical position, and adduction is towards the midline. So uh, I can uh, abduct, I can adduct, I can flex and extend. And as I'll be stressing again in a second by putting all of these together, I get a circular motion. That is not rotation, we'll get to that. Um, that is in something, instead something known as circumduction uh, when we put together flexion, extension, abduction, and adduction. So there are a number of different joints in uh, the hand. And once again, I'm gonna be repeating uh, much of uh, this, and so if a little sinks in each time, then, then you're doing fine. So uh, now getting to uh, the elbow. Uh, the elbow is another example of a hinge joint, and like the hinge of a door, you have you know, this rounded convex surface in a, a concave surface, but it can only move in one plane, all right? And so this would allow, say, flexion and uh, extension of uh, the elbow, okay? And so here, um, so if you imagine then uh, the uh, concave uh, portion of the trochlear notch and the convex portion of the trochlea, uh, 
when they fit together, this allows uh, the trochlea to move back and forth, um, allowing the flexion and extension of the uh, forearm. Now, I, I know that for a student, we've already had more levels of classification than you're comfortable with, um, but we could add one more, I'm just mentioning. Uh, so you could ask how many axes uh, of movement are there. So when the earth revolves around its axis, we imagine that there is an invisible line going through the middle of the earth and that the movement is occurring around this line. And in the same way here, when I flex and extend my forearm, I could imagine that there is an invisible line and all movement is going along um, uh, around this axis. So um, a hinge joint is an example of a monoaxial joint. There is movement in one plane only. Now, once again, I'll kind of do hinge joints as a group in a second. But while we're here in the elbow, we see a different type of joint between the head of the humerus and the, um, uh, and, uh, the capitulum of I, I'm sorry, the head of the radius and the capitulum of uh, the humerus, um, because uh, this head has a little circular notch where it can rotate. Um, so uh, when something rotates, uh, that then also is moving in a plane. So when I rotate my hand um, here, now that's a shoulder thing, we'll get back to that. Um, that was one plane uh, uh, that uh, the movement was occurring around. So a pivot joint like this one is only allowing movement in one uh, plane. And because we have a circular structure uh, in a circular uh, ring, uh, it, once again, it's called a pivot joint allowing uh, for rotation. And as we'll see, this allows for the pronation and supination of the uh, forearm. So we had two joints at the elbow, both the hinge joint between the trochlea and uh, the trochlear notch and the pivot joint um, with the head of the radius in that uh, radial notch. Um, the knee is another example of a hinge joint, uh, which allows flexion and uh, extension. We have these two condyles of the femur, which fit into the two condyles of the uh, tibia uh, and can slide along it. Um, now note that the knee is composed of three bones, the femur, the patella, and the tibia. Although the fibula comes close to the knee, it doesn't make up part of, uh, of the knee. So the knee uh, joint is between the medial and lateral condyles of the femur and the corresponding condyles of the tibia and the patella here in this patellar surface. It is, uh, all of these are diarthroses, freely movable joints. Uh, they are synovial joints because they have a synovial cavity. And this then is a hinge joint, which allows flexion and extension of, uh, of the knee. Right. And so once again, um, we can uh, flex uh, the knee and it flexes in the posterior direction, which is odd because most other body parts are flexing anteriorly. And when we return to anatomical position, that is uh, extension. Now, um, at the ankle, you know, if you remember, the vertebral column had a number of different joints. Uh, and, and so therefore, you know, a lot of actions were occurring here. The same thing in the foot. Um, inversion and eversion is primarily occurring uh, from movements between the tarsal bones. The ankle joint, uh, which is composed of one tarsal bone, the talus, articulating with the tibia and the fibula, um, that allows for what's called dorsiflexion if the toes were curled upwards, or then plantar flexion if the toes then uh, point downwards. And so uh, the foot you know, is capable of a number of movements, but there's multiple joints here. So once again, the ankle joint between the talus, the tibia, and the fibula, uh, this allows dorsiflexion and plantar flexion, while the intertarsal joints allow for inversion and uh, eversion. We have two pivot joints in the body. Uh, the one was between the uh, radius uh, and um, uh, the radial notch of uh, the 
uh, on the ulna. Um, the second one is where we consider uh, that the second, uh, oh, so once again, oh, skip that, I'm sorry. Um, we'll come back to you. All right, so never mind, we're here. Um, so here, once again, here's the radial notch and the head of the radius can spin in this. You can actually feel this. If you put your fingers on uh, this part of your arm and then you uh, pronate and supinate your arm, you can feel the head of the radius uh, spinning there as a, a pivot uh, joint. Um, now, um, because the ulna is staying still, we're not seeing the whole forearm rotate. Instead, the, um, the radius uh, can then slide over the ulna in what's called uh, pronation. If the palms are facing posteriorly, or supination if the palms are facing anteriorly. When we're in anatomical position, we are supinated, and then we can uh, have uh, the uh, action of this pivot joint uh, create then a pronation where we uh, have the um, palms facing posteriorly, if the alliteration of the letter P helps you there. Um, the second uh, pivot joint that we have in our body is where we have the dens of the axis, the second vertebra uh, in uh, the body. And then the atlas, if you remember the only vertebrae which doesn't have uh, a body, can then fit over this and it can then spin. And when we shake our heads, no, uh, what's happening is that uh, the atlas uh, without its body is spinning around the dens of the axis. The axis is serving as an axis of uh, rotation. Um, so here's our second pivot joint uh, between the atlas and the axis. And once again, this allows us uh, to shake our heads uh, no. Uh, so once again, uh, some joints like hinge joints and pivot joints are sometimes called monoaxial joints because uh, they allow movement in one plane only. There are also joints which are biaxial. Uh, they allow movement in uh, two planes. Um, and a good example of this would be the wrist joint. Now the wrist joint is composed of the radius and two of the eight carpal bones, the scaphoid and the lunate. The ulna is more serving a supporting role. So the radius, the scaphoid, and the lunate, these are forming uh, the wrist joint. It is a type of joint called a condyloid joint, where in general we have a con uh, cave uh, surface and a convex surface, which is now going to allow two types of movement. So not only can I flex and extend my wrist in this plane, but I can also abduct and adduct um, uh, the wrist in a different plane. So there are two different planes of uh, movement, uh, flexion forward and extension backwards, abduction away from the midline, adduction towards the midline. Uh, once you can do flexion, extension, abduction, and adduction, then you can put them all together and do something known as circumduction. That's different from rotation. If I could rotate my wrist, I could turn it so that the palm faces you uh, while keeping my forearm still. I obviously can't uh, do that. So um, uh, and the, uh, this is what's called circumduction because I'm just mixing uh, flexion, adduction, extension, adduction. Just by putting them together, I get this. Uh, that is different from rotation, this circumduction. Uh, and so that is, uh, these are the actions which are possible at this uh, condyloid joint. So notice now uh, we're moving in a different plane, allowing adduction and adduction in addition to the flexion and extension that you saw. And by putting these uh, uh, together, uh, you can then get circumduction. Uh, once again, uh, going back to the hand, uh, the same thing was true here. I can flex and extend. I can abduct and adduct, and then obviously then perform uh, circumduction. Now, one of the condyloid joints of the body is um, specialized and therefore allows for a greater amount of movement. 
it is known as a saddle joint because of the shape resembling a saddle. And this is what uh, connects the trapezium uh, to the uh, metacarpal of the thumb. So it is a, um, a saddle uh, joint, um, uh, which then is more mobile than a regular uh, condyloid joint, which is why I can then have what's called opposition, where I can touch uh, the tips of my fingers with my thumb. Now this gives us a great manual dexterity, uh, which allows us to use tools and, and do so many things. And so the saddle joint, uh, which uh, unites uh, the trapezium, the metacarpal at the base of the thumb, and the metacarpal of the thumb, uh, this is a very uh, significant uh, joint. Um, and then finally, we get to the most mobile joints of the body. They are called ball and socket joints because a rounded ball fits into a socket. And here we have multiple axes of movement. So not only do we allow for flexion and extension, um, but also then uh, abduction and adduction. Uh, whenever you can do flexion, extension, abduction, and adduction, then you can also then do circumduction. Uh, and then also you can do rotation, right? So here you can see a rotation at the shoulder, uh, which is another plane of movement. So the uh, whenever we have uh, a rounded ball and a socket, we then have uh, a, a ball and socket uh, joint. Uh, and we have two such joints in the body, the shoulder, which allows uh, for uh, flexion, uh, extension and a little hyperextension. So we'll see that here. All right, so uh, moving this uh, forward from anatomical position, that is the flexion of the arm, extension back to anatomical position, and then we can perform a bit of uh, hyper uh, extension as well. Uh, then uh, if we were to look at another view, uh, you could see that movement away from the midline is known as abduction. Uh, movement back towards the midline is adduction. And so uh, ball and socket joints allow uh, this type of movement as well. Whenever uh, we uh, can do flexion, extension, abduction, and adduction, we put them all together and that's what's called circumduction. Uh, so we can perform that movement with uh, the arm. Uh, but then also uh, these ball and socket joints are so mobile that they allow for a uh, rotation uh, as, uh, as, uh, as well. All right, and so from this position, if you just you know, moved your arms like this, as you can see there, that is a uh, rotation. The second ball and socket joint in uh, the body is what we see between the round head of the femur and the uh, socket at uh, the acetabulum, um, which you know matches it uh, beautifully. And so here, once again, we have a multi-axial joint uh, capable of movement uh, in multiple planes. And so this will allow uh, flexion, uh, extension, uh, abduction, adduction, uh, circumduction, and then um, uh, rotation as well. So once again, movement away from the midline is known as uh, abduction, movement towards the midline, uh, adduction. And then we uh, can perform uh, flexion, extension when we return to anatomical position, uh, hyperextension. If we move a little farther uh, uh, posteriorly, and then we can also then um, uh, permit uh, some uh, rotation uh, as, as well. So this is a, a multi-axial uh, joint. Um, I was going to review the major uh, motions uh, again, um, but you know, very often if you enter healthcare, you may you know, enter a profession where you're uh, specializing in one type of uh, you know, region of uh, the body. And so, uh, you know, those uh, concerned with, um, you know, the, the head, uh, the oral surgery, et cetera, uh, there is another joint which could be uh, con considered the temporomandibular uh, joint, 
uh, or TMJ. Um, this allows us uh, to uh, depress the scapula, pushing it uh, uh, downwards when we open our mouths to elevate the scapula. We can push our uh, uh, jaws uh, outward for protraction, pull it back, retraction, and perform lateral displacement uh, as well. And so the TMJ um, uh, allows a number of different types of Finally, I have some additional uh, videos because uh, when I teach anatomy and physiology labs, uh, the joint lab is just before the lab midterm. And so I find that a lot of students are, are stressed, they're overwhelmed by learning all of the bones and their structures. And then the joint chapter, since that's the week right before the midterm, very often they don't get a chance to uh, study it. And then just they you know, very often do horribly on that uh, section. Uh, and one of the things that's frustrating is because some of the questions I would ask is simply at this joint, what type of movements are uh, allowed? And I have a lot of students just leave it blank. And I yell at them afterwards. I mean, like, if someone asks you what you can do with your elbow, cheat. You brought an elbow with you, two of them. Use it, and you can say, oh, look, flexion and extension, etc." And so one of the things I encourage my classes to do is we all stand up, and then we kind of do, you know, what I call zombie yoga uh, together, where we do this because it's one thing a lot of students just try to memorize things then on the day of the exam you know it becomes a blur and they panic and they forget um but then if this is something that you physically do with yourself you know and because you brought these joints with you you have these joints so move them and 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 you know i think this is a, a better way of you know learning and you can say oh look at you know what i'm doing here and, and then it's not memorization that you can forget you, you really do understand uh, and so whether you wanted to follow along with the zombie yoga instructor or just focus here that we have, once again, different types of diarthroses, which allow different types of movement. So where we have flat surfaces sliding along each other, we call that a gliding movement, which we can then also um, in the foot call inversion and eversion. So if you were to ask what actions are permitted between the intertarsal joints? That's inversion and eversion. The ankle is different. And we'll get to that in just uh, a second. Um, uh, one of the, the major classes of joints in the body is a monoaxial joint called a hinge joint. Uh, so as we've seen, the elbow, the knee, the joints between the phalanges, uh, these uh, would be uh, examples of uh, hinge joints, which allow flexion and extension. Once again, in the anatomical position, we are uh, extended, all right? And then um, uh, when we uh, flex our forearms, uh, we move uh, together in the anterior plane, and then returning to anatomical uh, position, uh, it is extended uh, once uh, again. And so, once again, I you know ask my students to to go through various you know poses. You know, we all do this together. But here you can see the elbow is now uh, flexed, um, uh, uh, rather than extended in anatomical position. Um, the knee is also a, a hinge joint, so we can flex and extend. Uh, the knee, the fingers uh, between the phalanges, uh, these are um, uh, uh, hinge uh, joints. And so here you can see some flexion of, uh, of the knee. And then the ankle uh, is a hinge joint. And here instead of referring to flexion and extension, we call it dorsiflexion when the toes point upwards and plantar uh, flexion. Uh, and so uh, you know, feel free to uh, practice uh, that. Um, between the vertebrae, we have a number of different joints, both the amphiarthroses between uh, the bodies of vertebrae and the uh, planar diarthroses between the articular processes. So our vertebral columns allow a number of movements, uh, flexion, extension, and hyperextension, lateral flexion on uh, these planes, and then also um, uh, rotation. Um, and so, uh, you know, you can uh, try moving, you know, the, the vertebrae of the neck, the vertebrae of the lumbar region, um, uh, etc.
Uh, there are two pivot joints in the body, once again, where we have a round structure in a, uh, a ring, uh, which allows it uh, to uh, rotate. The best example is uh, between the atlas and axis, uh, which allow us to shake our heads no, um, but then also uh, that round head of the radius in the uh, radial notch of the ulna, uh, so this proximal radial ulnar joint uh, allows for pronation where the, palm, the palms face posteriorly and supination, okay. sometimes the skeletons get a little carried away, um, and uh, supination, uh, which is uh, how uh, the arm is oriented in, uh, in anatomical uh, position. Um, so uh, uh, those are monoaxial joints which allow movement in one uh, plane. Uh, there are also biaxial joints which allow movements in two planes, uh, such as the condyloid joints of the wrist or between the uh, metacarpal bones and the um, uh, proximal uh, phalanges. So here at the wrist, this would allow flexion extension, abduction, adduction, and then putting all of these together. This would then also allow circumduction, uh, which is different uh, from the uh, uh, from uh, rotation. Once again, the saddle joint uh, between the trapezium and metacarpal of the thumb, this is a modified condyloid joint, uh, which uh, allows uh, you know, even more movement, including opposition of uh, the digits. Uh, and then finally, the most uh, movable joints in uh, the body are the multiaxial uh, joints, uh, which allow flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, circumduction, and then even uh, and then even rotation. And so, uh, I, I, you know, obviously, in these exercises, uh, when you hear the sound, you know, the uh, each of these you know limbs has its own position, but you can you know see. Uh, you know, the, the flexion extension of, you know, these ball and socket joints, uh, etc. cetera. Okay. Uh, and so I think one of the, the easy ways of practicing uh, these, um, uh, these actions and uh, these joints is to think of your own uh, body and your own joints. And that way, you know, you can actually then practice, say, during an exam, uh, rather than treat this as something which needs then to uh, be memorized, uh, because then obviously it's easy uh, to, you know, forget or, you know, with a little test anxiety get uh, mixed up. Uh, so this was a survey of some of the joints of the body and the actions they allow.